All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Enabling Business Agility uh, with OpenStack. My name is Dave Pitsley. I'm the, um, I lead the infrastructure architecture team at Comcast. I'm Mark Baker. I'm the uh, OpenStack product manager at Canonical, the Ubuntu people. I'm Leong. I'm principal engineer for Liberty IT, so we are part of the um, enterprise IT for Liberty Mutual Insurance Group. And uh, we're a pretty diverse group. Like, how do we come to meet each other? Um, we met through the enterprise working group, um, the OpenStack working group. You may have heard it mentioned uh, during the, the, the keynotes. Uh, the, the goal of the enterprise working group is to, it's two-sided. One is to uh, help drive more enterprise adoption of OpenStack. And the other side of it is really driving more enterprise requirements into the OpenStack community to, you know, really further along the platform. So with that, let's get started. Um, we have, uh, we prepared a lot of content for you, which we hope you enjoy. And uh, we've saved some time at the end for, to, for questions. We've also, uh, we'll sit outside uh, as well if you want, um, if you want to ask us some questions or get an autograph headshot. Whatever Absolutely, you, we're available for that. That's right, whatever you guys like. Uh, so now what? The purpose of today's talk is you've decided to move forward with OpenStack, um, now what? Uh, you know, so our, our, uh, there's quite a few things to consider and our goal for today is to walk you through, uh, hopefully, some of the, uh, how to avoid most of the pitfalls and um, really accelerate the time to uh, deliver real business value from OpenStack implementation for the enterprise. So with that, you know, the first step on our journey is uh, how do you pay for this thing? You know, OpenStack is free, right? Free like a puppy. So, <laughs> Mark, what are some of the, what are some of the uh, financial considerations that people need to keep in mind? So, certainly, um, there is no such thing as free, right? As everybody knows, free, free software uh, whilst it may be available uh, for free download, um, implementing free software takes people and people cost money. Um, the three broad categories that we've uh, looked at in terms of cost considerations, uh, migration, right? How do you get applications into OpenStack? Nobody does OpenStack just for fun. That may be the exception here this week, actually, but um, most businesses don't do OpenStack for fun, right? So uh, they're looking to solve business problems. People don't the old adage, people don't buy servers because they want servers, they buy servers to run business applications and solve business problems. And so putting applications into OpenStack and working out where the economics lie in terms of uh, uh, migrating existing applications, obviously new apps, uh, cloud native apps, applications. Uh, people, uh, the role of obviously how do you get your OpenStack environment up and running. And uh, it's pretty clear that even though OpenStack has come a long way in the four years, um, it still needs smart, experienced people to get it up and running and then to run it operationally uh, and effectively. And then um, vendors, right? I work for an OpenStack vendor. There are many here, all of them uh, with various claims about how they can Im you know, make your lives better and save you money and do things faster and uh, uh, change your business. So um, the role of these three cost considerations really uh, migration on people and vendors are areas that we're going to drill down into. Click. <laughs> so, um, a lot of the goal with OpenStack is to try and save money, right? Who, who was trying to use OpenStack to save money? Good. How's that working out? This <laughs> is good. <laughs> good, good, good. So, a lot of the, the, the current infrastructure is that. Um, is, is costing you money, right? And that's whether it could be based on proprietary technologies, it could be based on uh, vertically integrated monolithic applications uh, that are costly to, to, to scale, costly to upgrade, uh, costly to manage. On the other side, and do we have, a, is this a build? We should have another piece coming up here. Okay, so, thank you. Um, a lot of those moving, we want to downscale that. We want to decrease the cost of that environment by moving into an open cloud environment. That's the goal of OpenStack. And so some of those, um, we want to move to an OpenStack environment to give us cost savings. Um, however, monolithic applications can be expensive to re-architect to move to an environment, an, a, a cloud native environment. And so 
depending on, if you, if you look at this from a pure ROI uh, perspective, um, it's, it, it can be very easy to, to, to say, well, the migration costs are prohibitively expensive, and therefore any efficiency savings that I'm going to get from my fantastic new OpenStack, Open Cloud, uh, are more than offset by the, uh, uh, by the migration costs. And so um, there has to be a process that you look at, at determining where the balance lies, right? What's the ROI I'm going to get from migration versus the complexity and cost involved with migrating those applications? So as a general rule of thumb, and we'll talk about, you know, it's very easy to, to say for you know, specifics um, uh, where this will not apply, but as a general rule of thumb, obviously the longer the lifespan of the application, the greater there is the opportunity to save money over the long term with an open cloud infrastructure. Because of the complexity of implementing OpenStack today and because of the, the, the cost, I think I saw today somewhere the average cost of an OpenStack um, developer and engineer is about $130,000 a year. Does that resonate with people? <laughs> Nobody's going to own up to that. So there's definite costs involved with this. And so the gener you know, in general, if, you, if your application only has another six months or two years to run on it, you need to look very carefully at where it's going to run. But if it's something that's, that's going to be in place for the next 10, 15 years, then clearly it's going to make much more financial sense to move into an open stack environment. Another guiding rule, a rule of thumb, if you like here, is that if your application is virtualized, it's going to be much easier to pull it into an open stack environment, right? This doesn't mean that you can take a VMDK from VMware, just drop it into OpenStack, have instant cloud goodness and operational uh, efficiency. Um, but it does mean that if it's virtualized already, um, that the application is happy running in a virtualized environment, and that certain aspects of that are going to be um, more appropriate to re-architecting for a scale-out, uh, more sort of software-defined, flexible infrastructure. Um, if it's not virtualized already, if you have applications that you know, where virtualization is verboten, you're not allowed to do that, it compromises vendor support, then that's gonna be much tougher for you, right? There's gonna be a lot of re-architecting or negotiations with that application vendor. So not virtualized today, look very, very carefully at whether that's gonna be applicable. People problems, right? Um, it's very interesting in doing this research to find that uh, who actually came up with this quote, the all problems are people problems. But it's certainly true, and I think if you look at some of the OpenStack survey data, and I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but um, often it is people are seen as being the biggest barrier to adopting OpenStack, right? Change can be hard. And a lot of people have this sort of uh, learned helplessness where they don't want to move away from what they know. This new, new areas are, uh, uh, can be scary. Um, but of course, the good news is, you know, we're surrounded by 6,000 people here this week that are all very excited about the prospect of moving to OpenStack. So all of these things are completely uh, uh, manageable. Um, with people, though, if we move on to the next slide, um, you have a number of options that you need to consider. All staff need to be trained, right? Any good company, Comcast, I'm sure does this, Absolutely. will invest in its people. So you need to train existing staff. However, that can take time. You can't take all of your team out for three months, get them all trained up on, on OpenStack. You can't take all of your team out for, for, for a week even and train them up on OpenStack, send them on the course, and expect them to be experts in OpenStack. So um, you need to train those existing staff, but you may need to uh, hire experienced people in conjunction with them. Who's hiring OpenStack expertise here? Like everybody. So, um, <laughs> so you need to hire those ex uh, experienced people, but good luck with that, you know, because not only are you competing um, with your peers in your industry, but you're competing with you know, HP and Rackspace and IBM and Red Hat and everybody, right? Everybody's looking for OpenStack experience, and so um, that's a tall order. Um, you can use consulting, of course, to get help get up and running, and there's a great many companies that will help you do that uh, that are here this week. Um, you can use combinations of all of those things, and I think that's typically the, the approach that, that most enterprises or most companies that we see uh, uh, are doing, right? They're training their existing staff at the same time, uh, hiring new people in or poaching people from their competitors and at the same time, bringing consultants in. Um, the fifth option, and it's very interesting to see Blue Box and others talking about this this week, is outsource it, right? Sort of throw your hands up and say, right? One, two, three is gonna take us a little while, and, but we want, you know, we want a cloud today, and so let's bring somebody else in uh, uh, to do that. And there are other providers from Blue Box, so too. So outsource everything, and I think that, you know, that's uh, an increasingly attractive option for many people. 
Vendors. So, are they a, a necessary evil in this world, or are they uh, uh, helpful value-added providers? Um, so, yeah, I think you need to understand how vendors can help you, if they can help you, and the, the criteria you can use to select them. Because there's a number of factors that can influence your choice, um, and a number of benefits that they can, uh, they can bring, but only if you um, make sure that what they're delivering is going to be aligned with your, uh, your long-term vision for the cloud and uh, your needs for that. So we'll talk about some of those kind of criteria. Um, vendors can help you save time. As Martin Mikos at MySQL a long time ago said, um, with open source, you can, you can spend time to save money or you can spend money and save time, right? The choice is yours, and as any organization, just needs to think about how it gets that balance right. And the same is obviously true, I think, with many of the vendors in the OpenStack world. You can pay a ton of money and have a complete bespoke off-the-shelf system delivered to you, um, but it could be expensive. Likewise, you can do it all yourself um, and not spend any money externally, spend perhaps a lot of money internally. But um, uh, so you, need, again, need to look at where that balance lies. <clears throat> um, our experience as a distribution is in talking to, uh, to people implementing OpenStack is that kind of the one of the, I don't know if it's the biggest concern, but, but certainly a big concern is, is how you avoid lock-in, right? So most people see OpenStack as being a strategic decision, business-led decision, um, and that infrastructure is going to be in place for a period of time. And that period of time could be three years, five years, ten years, who knows? But it's going to be in the place for a while. And um, th that means that they need to understand, you need to understand, think about the flexibility and options that you want in the future. It's very hard to say what the OpenStack world is going to look like in five years' time. Right? Who's the dominant uh, vendor, if any, and um, the, the way in which it's going. So you need to try and think about how do you maintain flexibility, how do you keep your options open as you go forward. Uh, and that means you know, understanding if there are proprietary add-ons in a distribution, understanding what those are, and how you know, they're going to benefit for you. Make that decision. Um, uh, be aware of, of any of those sort of vendor-specific modifications. You know, it doesn't mean don't use anything that's proprietary, because often that could, you know, may save you money, it may save you time in the, in the long term. But understand what you're getting yourself into if you go down that path. There's also a big change in culture, you know, coming back to the people problems. So, um, I, I think this is probably less of a problem now than it was uh, 18 months or two years ago. But a lot of that traditional enterprise mentality is about um, put it in place. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't touch it. Just leave it running, humming along, doing its thing. And um, look for support cycles from vendors that span you know, five years or 10 years. Right? That doesn't work in the OpenStack world. Changes, you know, when you release every six months, Mid-cycle sprints that you can go and participate if you want, you know, with new stuff, uh, uh, getting stuff on the roadmap very quickly. So, if you try and implement that same uh, methodology, the same process, you're going to end up. And you see some OpenStack users like this today that are stuck on Essex or Fulsome, thinking it's too scary to upgrade. I don't know what I'm going to do. But each each cycle they leave it, the harder and worse it's going to get. Right? Because jumping from Essex to Juno is going to be a lot more painful than, than jumping from, from Icehouse to Juno. Right? So that, that mindset needs to change. People need to understand that things move faster. Uh, and that's a good thing. Right? Each new release gets, hopefully, more stable, touch wood, hopefully more stable, more featureful, and better for you and your business. Now, Mark, you were going to ask me about application selection. Yes. I'm so glad you did. <laughs> so we've got <laughs> so, the big, so for application selection, this is uh, this is tricky. I mean, this this is probably one of the most uh, overwhelming decisions. Um, every enterprise has uh, you know a, a massive pipeline of functionality to deliver. Um, uh, you know, finite resources, and uh, you know, just all of these aggressive timelines. Where exactly do you kind of inject this revolutionary change? So the advice here is really start at home. Um, you want to look at something that's traditionally within the sphere of influence of a CIO. Now, you may, your company may not have a CIO, but within that general influence. So 
uh, document repositories, um, uh, uh, collaboration software, system management tools. You really want to start there uh, before you, have, you know, expose this out to all of your business partners. And the reason being, there are going to be failures. You're rolling out a new design pattern on new infrastructure and theoretically probably a new engineering team or an engineering team dealing with this technology for the first time. So you really want to shake all that out a little closer to home. Um, so from that, like, let's say, you know, now, now that you've kind of vetted this out a little bit and you feel like you've shaken this out, now you've got this, I don't know, put your left arm, put your left arm out, Liana. Okay, so this many applications, Let's see if we can try to shrink. This is your application portfolio from here to Leong's hand. Um, uh, uh, Scott Alcott, who's the CIO of, of Comcast, refers to this as Jurassic Park. It's the who's who of technology over a series of decades. Um, and how do you really kind of dig into this and, and uh, try to shift it? Um, uh, this is a really difficult question to ask, and there's no simple answer. So I'll give you some patterns and anti-patterns. So number one is, you know, if you go after, could you move vertically scaled applications into uh, the cloud in general? Absolutely. But you're going to spend a tremendous amount of time. You're going to spend, oh, that was really loud. You're going to spend a tremendous amount of time, um, uh, and the yield will be very low. Uh, at the end of the day, the application uh, will likely not perform as well as it did uh, originally, and you may have issues with availability. Um, you really want to focus on some lower hanging fruit. So, I mean, just some basic examples here is like if you have your classic ERP systems or um, you know financial systems, probably not the best candidate for your first out of the gate. Um, variable volume workloads. So. Um, if you have, you know, people who've been in the enterprise for a while, remember when, like, SOA was the new hotness, that infrastructure exists out there. Um, and uh, these are great, like, highly transactional uh, systems that you can move, um, make great candidates for moving. Uh, data analytics, event mediation, anywhere where, um, uh, where you're doing advertisement, click-through data, that type of thing, these are highly variable, highly scaled, these you'll, you could get tremendous benefit out of. So the next big question is, do I try to take this application and um, move this up? So I guess I've narrowed it down to, I guess, this, <laughs> this amount of applications. So now I take my application, do I try to just pick it up and move it into a, a cloud design pattern, or you know, do I kind of cap functionality, let that live, and start building Greenfield over here in the new design pattern. So this is the right question, but the scope is wrong. You really want to try to avoid and resist end-to-end -end rewrites. This is probably the biggest pitfall. You really want to look at it as a component-by-component -component basis. Let me give you an example. I just so happen to have a slide ready. So we, um, this is just a fictitious application, and it's very arbitrary. Any of this can be debated, I'm sure. But there are web components and there are middleware components that today lend themselves to horizontal scaling. This is in a lot of applications. And then I have a, a messaging component there, and that may or may not. But the, in general, data persistence is hard. It is the hardest part, and is one of the hardest things to wrap your mind around when you're designing cloud applications. So if you have that, if you're taking an existing application, don't mess with that first. Leave it where it is. If you have a vertically scaled appliance that's running your database server, leave it there for now. Don't make that the first out of the gate. Start with some of the simple things. Start with the web front ends, moving those in. Messaging gets hard as well. Leave messaging alone. Maybe you have an opportunity there. Like I said, it all depends on the apps. There's no, there's no clear answer. But the big takeaway here is don't try to, lift, don't try to move the entire application. Try to move it in, in, in pieces. And straddling these different technologies is not a bad thing, especially there's going to be an evolution. Your infrastructure should follow that same evolutionary path. The other big benefit um, that you can gain is through non-prod activities functional testing environments, development environments, integration environments. These are great. As you, uh, uh, those who attended the keynotes, you saw that uh, eBay and PayPal are 
of their dev, uh, all of their dev activities are running in OpenStack. It gives developers a tremendous amount of power to create and destroy at will um, and recreate all with, the, with simple interfaces and predictable APIs. Um, something to consider there is if, you do, if, if you're using a follow the sun type model, where however you're supporting OpenStack, whether you provide a vendor or you build a team, that really needs to follow the same model. If your dev is follow the sun, you need to have support that follows the sun. Dev is gonna need help, and when they do, they really need it. You don't wanna stop, you don't wanna stop dev from creating, you don't wanna stop, if you're doing formal QA, you don't want to stop QA from testing. There are gonna be issues, you do need to support them. And this is the last point here, is um, developers are really key to your success. Absolutely can't stress that enough. Uh, one of the big pitfalls here is, is really moving so far in the direction of getting the infrastructure up and running that you go after and try to sell the concept of, of cloud after the fact. I've seen company after company do this. And it, it, uh, uh, you really need to start that journey early on, in parallel to building this. You have to evangelize cloud design patterns. You need to make sure that developers are um, comfortable moving that direction, they have some input, they have some buy-in, um, and that you're, you're providing that level of support throughout the process. So um, with that in mind, Leong, tell us about what are some of the things you really need to, to stick the landing for uh, dev acceptance? Well, I think um, if you guys remember the uh, Monday keynote sessions, everything is moving toward software. So as, as Dave mentioned just now, developers are very important. So it's very important to get your developers on board throughout your, your OpenStack cloud journey. Good. So uh, nowadays, people, um, we, a lot of companies talk about CI CD. So in this CI CD pipeline, there's a lot of different tool sets in, inside. So you really have to think about how can you empower your developers with the right tool set. So OpenStack itself, I mean, as infrastructure as a service, provide the right platforms for developers. The API model, the self-service model, really help you to empower the developers to do what they want. And using OpenStack, you can provide a consistent environment across development, QA, staging, or production environment. And that really helps a lot for your developers. And having tools set it itself is not enough. And culture is also very important. Because this is totally a new development model for a lot of enterprise company. And you really have to get the developers and also the operation people to think about the DevOps movement. And you have the mindset changes and culture changes. And one of the key things here is the changes of mindset or culture has to be driven from the leadership, the senior leadership. So a lot of time when we talk about culture, we always have to um, challenge your existing status quo, uh, including your enterprise existing processes. So things like your asset management, your incident management, those kind of processes. You really have to get the senior leadership, the C-level people to, 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 to drive the changes. Um, so another thing is about design mentality. So you have to get your people, your developers, even the operation people to understand the differences between traditional deploying the application on traditional uh, infrastructures and the cloud-based environment. So, um, but I'm not going to talk, talk too much details about this slide because um, tomorrow at five o'clock we have another session talking about um, enterprise strategies for cloud aware app. So we, we'll, we'll talk about discuss more about um, that tomorrow. So the next thing, other recommendation I would suggest is, um, especially if you are first deploying OpenStack in your company, if you're having a close physical proximity between your developers and the operation people or the deployment team that will help a lot. I'm not saying that it's a must, but if you can get people to, 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 to be in the same place, that will give you a lot of benefits. And another thing is uh, the support channel. So traditionally, we think about a lot of ticket-based model. We go to help desk, and there's a longer turnaround time. So you have to think about um, um, providing some sort of real-time model. So you can use things like IRC channels, and which provide a quick and real-time um, uh, response. And you also have to think about the self-service. Make it self-service for developers. So make sure your documentations, your user manual, user guides easily and 
as use, easily and widely accessible for, for, for the developers. So these are things that I think is quite important for developers. So maybe you want to touch, uh, talk something about um, um, the uh, political perspective? Oh, yeah. yeah. So the, the, the political aspect is one of the dicier aspects of, the, of uh, enabling agility that we're going to talk about, I think. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this, this isn't uncommon. So if you kind of take a look at it from most business owners' perspective, we're, we're, you're basically proposing uh, we're, we're going to pull resources away from incremental functionality. Uh, we're going to make this investment. Um, and uh, oh, by the way, things may be a little unstable during this entire journey. So it's really not, it's really easy to see the perspective of a business owner who's like, look, that's great, this is a nice little science project, but uh, you know, not in my, not in my backyard. Um, a big tip here is you really need to be cognizant of pain tolerance. So when you're working, the, the, the goal here is you really want to be selective about the business part, your business partners and how you're going to go about uh, moving forward those applications that we talked about, which applications you're going to use. You really want to get your business partner tightly aligned with you and um, go into this together as a, as, as a true partnership. Um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to select your applications, this is, where, this is the part that's kind of a little dicey. There's no real formula for. You want to kind of stay away from the extremes. So if you have an application that is this hot button between um, the, the uh, IT organization and uh, the different business units, or it's failing all the time or it's having issues, that may not be the best candidate for this. Um, similarly, on the other side of the spectrum, you want to take the absolute most rock solid uh, application that's never having any issues and target that either, because that may draw unwanted attention in those areas. Um, the other tip is watch your language. Uh, not that you would lose your cool. Um, this is more along the lines of, uh, you know, you're not moving XYZ application to OpenStack. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make XYZ elastically scalable. That's the language you need to use. What you don't want to do is you don't want to have a tight coupling between the appli some application and the underlying infrastructure, because when something goes wrong, that could cause you even greater headaches later on. Um, you need to set some realistic, expecta <coughs> sorry, realistic expectations. So um, there's going to be instability. And when you're working with your business partners, like, you've got to know that up front. You've got to really focus on where you're headed. We're really trying, like, what are the actual goals? Um, uh, and know that it's going to get worse before it gets better, in a lot of cases, but then that's OK. Um, be transparent. So if um, the good and the bad. So if your goal is you want to, like this is going to improve availability overall and lower the total cost of ownership for an application, you need to have some metrics that show that. And you need to review it on a constant basis so you know whether or not, and I said when I say review it, I mean you need to review that with your business owners so that it's clear whether you're, whether you're heading in the right direction or the wrong direction. So take the good, take the bad, take them both. There you have, that's an American reference probably. I don't know if that's gonna make it across. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, how do we, where does this transfer? Oh yeah. yeah, that's right. So, so um, you really wanna be clear about the business value and uh, like I mentioned, the TCO piece. But there are way more, there are way more um, ways to measure business value. And Leon, why don't you talk us through that? Yeah, okay, yeah. So I think every technology must create value to the business. But the key thing is, how can we map this kind of technical capabilities into the business value? So when we talk about OpenStack, we, also met, we always talk about open source, able to reduce um, commercial um, licensing fee, and we can run on commodity hardware. You can, with different kind of um, hardware vendors, is, you give you open architectures and open design, it can 
potentially move into the hybrid cloud or multi-cloud models, having a uh, supporting by a wide ecosystem. But how are we going to map these technical capabilities into the business value? So um, there's a one company, um, not my company, um, there's one company that published uh, an article talking about uh, analyzing the value of implementing OpenStack in their environment. So they, they compared three different uh, deployments with 25 servers, 150 servers, and 500 servers, and they compared the cost, the benefits, and measure the ROI. And what I want to en um, emphasize here is the next slide. Um, the cost considerations is something that you can consider. You have to, because those are the things that you need to show to your um, CFO, CFO people. But I want you to focus on the benefit side. So, sorry, the color's a bit weird. So the benefit side, I think, is what, what you need to focus on. Because, for example, things like the IT efficiency improvement. So by using OpenStack, basically you can automate a lot of different things. So it potentially you save a lot of um, maintenance and efforts. You, know, you can actually reallocate your um, um, uh, operation resources to do some more value-added activities rather than spend, spending time doing all the routine job, daily routine job, because those things you can automate through OpenStack. And I was thought about um, user productivity. You, have, you also look at the, need to look from the user productive perspective. So by, by, by putting this, uh, the applications uh, in a self-service model, so the user is able to get whatever they need in a more faster way. And other things like um, application value, which I want to talk about here, application value. Your applications will not, OK, I phrase it this way. Your, your application will not be delivering any value to the company as long as it is not deployed. Right? You, the, the application will only be able to add value to the business once it is deployed. So the key thing is this is what I call the time to value. So your formula developments up to the point of the deployed application, um, some people call it time to market, but I'll, I'll phrase it in a way that it's time to value, time to add value to the business. You can measure that the shorter the time to value period is the better. So using OpenStack, when you, when you try to measure the value of OpenStack, you really have to think about not just about the cost, you focus on application value, the time to value. I think that's very key, important pieces. So being, being able to be agility, um, able to, to do innovation faster, you can run different kind of experiments, the time to market, as I say, those kind of thing is actually much more greater than the cost considerations. And, and one thing I want to man measure, uh, uh, talk, uh, discuss here, uh, talk, uh, is about reliability. And traditionally, I think um, a lot of companies used to buy a lot of expensive hardware to increase this mean time between failure. And they also use a lot of hardware-based redundancy to improve your availability. But when coming to the OpenStack cloud environment, it gives us an option to think about using or maximizing the automation tools to reduce the mean time to repair. And you can use a lot of um, different kind of uh, software-based redundancy um, model in the OpenStack environment, such as using um, multiple region uh, availability zone, using the heat orchestration or the auto scaling features, or auto healing features to help you to increase the system availability or system reliability using a different way. So we are looking at a shift from um, using hardware to, to increase the mean time to between failure to using software solution to reduce your mean time to repair. Yeah. So um, next thing I think probably, um, Mark, you want to talk about um, the YOY funding? Yeah, so um, because this is an investment um, over a period of time, and because it's based on open source, readily available software, um, there are, the way in which it's funded changes. Now, it, it is, obviously, there is funding involved, there is cost involved, but typically there's not going to be, if I pick on you know, a proprietary vendor, a big proprietary vendors of, of database software, for example, um, that have these very expensive kind of upfront license fees, CapEx license fees. The considerations here are, are different. You need to plan uh, for there being much more operations, much more operational expense. And therefore, when you're applying for funding or you're seeking your budget approvals, um, this funding is going to appear in different buckets, right? And it's also going to be harder for your um, uh, purchasing teams to wrap their heads around, right? Because they can't go and necessarily negotiate with the vendor and, and take a $10 price and turn it into a $5 price, right? Because it's operational expense 
It could be consulting. It could be uh, hiring people. It could be training. It could be all of these things, right? Investing in community, which is, I mean, how do you put a price on that? But we know we need to do it when you're implementing OpenStack. So be prepared to start to switch some of that funding discussion away from, uh, uh, you know, for budgetary approval, for, for upfront. People like decreasing upfront fees, of course, but they need to be uh, understand that uh, that some of that money is going to need to be freed up for, for that ongoing operational expense. Some companies will talk about chargeback model. Yeah, so you can use the chargeback model to a different department to fund your future and the further imp improvement for the open stack environment. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And the key takeaway there is that, like really need to consider that up front. Yes. Like, don't wait exactly. to the, don't wait till you're deep into it, right? Yeah. Um, so some final takeaways, you know, uh, developer adoption is key. Couldn't, couldn't stress that enough. Uh, you really want to start that early, start that conversation early, start uh, evangelizing early, and be really diligent throughout. Um, the political aspects, so being cognizant of the political landscapes, pick your business partners wisely. Um, define and measure value. So be really crisp about what you expect to get out of the transition. Be, be prepared to measure it and be transparent, uh, good or bad. It, you'll start to lose respect if everything's all sunny day uh, and exciting, even though it doesn't necessarily feel that way. If there's a general feeling that things aren't going well, um, you really need to ad address where it's not going well and what the plan is to, to, uh, you know, to make it through it. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. I think we've got, two we've got a couple minutes. Hey, got two questions for you. The first one, uh, you know, when modeling out the business case, do, when you look at sort of the usage part of it, and, you know, because I've seen business cases in my own company where people are like, well, when we're fully pattern-based and everything's cloud and elastic, um, we'll have fewer things sitting around because developers want to leave it there because it's hard to rebuild. So sort of the idea that persistent images in a dev test environment will go down so you'll, if you have a metered service through a, a cloud provider, that your costs will go down overall. Um, but I think I've heard a couple times this week that expect when everything gets magical and pattern-based and push button to deploy, that developers will just deploy more and usage will just go up. Um, so I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts on, on the usage patterns when you make things easier to consume. Yeah. I'll take the sure. Oh, yeah. So um, like, like Leong mentioned, you know, one way to try to combat that, that sprawl, that free candy, you know, it's like you can get as much as you want and there's no real repercussion, is really, you know, if, as you start to pursue show back and charge back, those types of models where you can try to push that cost back into different business units and you know, make, it, uh, make it visible. You know, the showback model, the thing you have to be careful about is that becomes politically charged as well. You know, sometimes when you do the showback and you're, you're totally transparent with what those costs are, um, you know, you need to make sure that you're cost competitive, uh, you're cost competitive in the market and that you're showing folks uh, information that is going to actually be used. So do you think you're, you're, I think you're saying it's smart to model increased usage, not reduced usage as a result of putting yeah, all the time? Yeah, that's right. I think, I mean, a, a good OpenStack cloud um, should consume multiple workloads and will grow, yeah. right? It, I mean, that's the role is to provide a, a platform that's going to encourage your, your developers to innovate, right? And I think that means increasing workload. Well, there'll be more use of stuff True. But exper it's experimentation, right? You know, I mean, yeah. and that, Innovation. Yeah. yeah. What, what we'll do is, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We'll, we'll answer your question 
we'll end because we're getting played off. <laughs> but but uh, we'll, we'll stick around and we'll answer your question, absolutely. Um, so thanks, everybody, for attending, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.